The magnitude 9.1 undersea megathrust earthquake was not the only disaster that struck the northeastern coast of Honshu Island that day. A tsunami hit the coast. More than 200 square miles of ground were flooded. At the town of Okuma in the Fukushima prefecture, the tsunami flooded the nuclear power plant, cutting off the power supply to a system responsible for cooling down the nuclear reactors. The temperature of the reactors increased and eventually caused explosions in four reactors. Okay. All right. This is John King, Jonathan King. John, we know each other from Landmark, but Correct. please tell me, what do you do for a living? <laughs> That's a great question. So on one hand, I'm an engineer, right? So I was trained in engineering and science. And on the other hand, I have a, a coaching and mentoring business uh -huh. as a side project. Yeah. To not only coach and mentor engineers and people who want to become engineers, but also like people who might take on something more like life coaching or something like that. Okay. So I operate in both the, the social world and the world of objects. Tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, you know, there's, there was this study done about like what do guys and girls like, so to speak, and it's like men are attracted to objects and women are attracted to people. I definitely went down the objects paradigm, like science and tech and well, cars I'm, and I'm into spaceships. People. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I'm into people. <laughs> When we created this idea for the video, you said, hey, why don't we talk about cold fusion? <laughs> cold fusion. So this is very trendy right now. Yes. What's happening in this field right now? Well, I think what's fun about it, it has this really sort of new agey woo woo kind of cold fusion name. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Why? <laughs> well, it's like, it kind of, it doesn't quite describe what it really is. I mean, on one hand, it says, okay, there's something cold and there's something fusing together. <laughs> but it, it sounds so nebulous. It's like, well, what the hell is it really? And so they under recently underwent a name change. And they're now... They? Who's they? They, they, they the <laughs> scientists and the, and the people working on the technology. And the headline was, AI goes wild. <laughs> it's come everywhere. <laughs> okay. The them. The know. them. Oh, of course. <laughs> There's always a them uh, yes. somewhere. Yeah. And that's low energy nuclear reactions. So this is the idea. It's like, you know, most people are familiar with like a giant fission reactor, Chernobyl or Fukushima. There's always some, you know, legendary accident that kind of brings fusion technology, excuse me, fission technology to light, right? O of the dangers of it and, you know, radioactivity and materials that you have to worry about afterwards. Uh huh. And then, you know, people have been chasing after fusion for a while now. And if you're familiar with fusion, you know what's called a tokamak. And that's, you know, you have... Hold on, hold on, yes, hold on. Yes, yes. A tokamak is the most advanced of current fusion machine designs. In order to get fusion reactions going, you need to keep your fuel hot enough and dense enough, like the center of a star. And you need to keep it like that for long enough for fusion reactions to occur. Let's start with people don't know what that is. Okay. So tell me what cold fusion is. So cold fusion is a small number of atoms fusing together, unlike the sun. So the sun, for example, has lots and 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 lots of hydrogen. Yeah. And it's fusing together into deuterium, and then deuterium is fusing together into heavier heavier elements. Deuterium is a real-life isotope utilized in a fictional device known as a warp core. A warp drive annihilates deuterium and antimatter through dilithium. Right, and the sun does that just because there's so much mass and there's so much pressure that you can fuse things together. Cold fusion is not that. It's a very small number of atoms getting together and fusing uh -huh. and releasing energy. Okay. It's interesting because if you can control or throttle that process, then you gain the ability to exploit energy on the small scale, like the car scale, the house scale, the bicycle scale, okay. the refrigerator scale of things, not the building or city yeah. scale of things. Okay. 
which can be very exciting for a person if they want to, say, move away from battery technology and get into something that maybe replaces batteries altogether. Hmm. So let's connect the idea of replacing the battery. Let's connect it to space, the moon, Mars, traveling to Mars, staying on Mars. Many of us have played video games where there's this idea of like a personal power pack. Yes. Right? Like an energy source of some kind. Yeah. And right now, if you want an energy source, you have a battery. You carry around a battery. Correct. And so what if there was a device, a low energy nuclear reaction device that was on the scale of a power pack, it's, it's person sized or maybe can get more compact eventually, that is generating energy. And maybe instead of storing energy, like what a battery does, this is creating energy. That's a different paradigm. It is a different paradigm. It's a much different paradigm, which is why it's trendy and people are very interested in, in it now. Because if there is a real, you know, cheese down that maze, a pony in the stable, like whatever metaphor you want to use for this, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like, this is, can be extraordinary for the scale of objects which are personal sized. You know, like I can have my low energy nuclear reaction, LENR, Lenner, device next to my house. Mm. that was, say, the same size as my air conditioning unit. Gotcha. And maybe, maybe 20 years from now, 50 years from now, it's like the way we think of elect generating electricity, you know, we think, oh, I'm going to put all these solar panels on my roof, or yeah. I'm going to have this giant closet full of batteries. Maybe that changes. And maybe we each house has their own personal power pack. Each car has their power pack. Each even airplane has their power pack so we don't need to uh, burn fossil fuels and we don't need to store energy from the sun that's what you're telling me basically down the road yeah now you may not want to get rid of your solar infrastructure I yeah mean, i don't why? see a reason why to, yeah to thrash it you know unless there's something we don't see 50 years down the road that we're like oh yeah that's a good idea but yeah. we don't have the hindsight or the wisdom yet to i think know that right yeah you build this engine Put it on a ship. Ship, airplane, car, truck. I mean, uh, so the it applications has energy. are, are yeah. ubiquitous. Yeah. How does it affect the travel time? So, if we're taking a starship for that. So, I think I think there's or any rocket. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think there is. In order to long as it isn't the wife we're good and so it's not the wife <laughs> <laughs> this region has so much water <laughs> look around you <laughs> it's like in order to get to space you need a lot of energy in a very short amount of time so i'm not saying that cold fusion or lenar lenr is the way to do that yeah okay right I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if we're talking about man, you creating power on a personal scale, that this is a technology that could be rev revolutionize our, I'll call it thinking, right? It's like, it wasn't that long ago that everyone had mechanical wristwatches. And then now we have electronic wristwatches. Yeah. And they interface with our phones. Yeah. And there's a whole paradigm of convenience and opportunity that that provided that we didn't have before. Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's like if you could manufacture power, kilowatts of power, on the personal scale, and you don't have to do that with batteries, that sort of changes your approach to things. It's like right now our approach is, right? And and, and no no harsh criticism to any of the electric car makers. I'm yeah. like, go for it, like great on you, you know, good work. No, no criticism there. However, it would also take all those electric car makers and then give them a new option for power, which isn't only batteries. I mean, you know, you're still gonna want batteries for, you know, turn the car off, you want some power available at, at some rate. So you turn the car on, you want some battery pack, but maybe you don't have to carry as many pounds of batteries. 
Yeah. Or maybe in the case of an aircraft, like if you're if you're going from, say, Israel to Los Angeles, right? Yeah. You know, what does this do for us to now have electric driven motors? We're not burning fossil fuels when we're flying anymore. And we're doing it all because we have low energy nuclear reaction devices on that ship, which enable, you know, which can generate in the kilowatts, possibly extending up to the milliwatt class, where you can now fly with this. So and you don't have to carry, you know, hundreds of thousand pounds of batteries to make that flight, that you now have a compact nuclear generation device that can generate power for you. How far are we from creating this engine? Yeah, you could call it engine, you could call it power plant. I mean, we'll call it whatever, whatever. you want. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. So there was several articles that came out in 2019. That's only three years ago. Uh -huh. You know, including, you know, governments that are working on this technology, mm -hmm. right? Including private industry that's working on this technology. All publicly available. These are all publicly available sources, right? This information wasn't a WikiLeak or anything like that. It's just engineers and scientists working hard on these kind of problems across the globe. Yeah. And so it occurs now that there are companies out there that are working on their prototype device literally as they speak and some of them which i want to go visit this summer of course like seem to have started the revolution and when you when i go there i'm going to find out like is this snake oil <laughs> or is it real right which is what we're all hoping for we're all hoping this is real so the articles were published 2019 yes and including then, all the way to now you could you could publicly available journal articles in the public domain you can see now from 2019 to now that seem to have had a breakthrough in you know compounds that are related to deuterium either you know creating a deuteriumized acetone i mean that sounds silly in terms of language it but sounds you, star Trek. yes yes it sounds like what are these compounds and how would you make them to actually just using hydrogen in a pressure vessel and getting those three hydrogens under very precise conditions with a very precise chronometer and a very precise laser to get those to fuse and release photons, energy. So before we started this video, yes. I asked you, what can I even ask you? And then you said, oh, let's just talk about the applications. Of yes, this. And, but, yes, but yes. It, it sounds redundant to speak about the applications of a power plant. The applications, everything. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. But it, it, it's to think about it now on the small scale. Like what if you had a backpack sized power plant? If your, say, air taxi or your, you know, 20 to 30 years from now, maybe you have a personal air vehicle, a small scale vehicle that travels through the air, that you need to jumpstart your air vehicle. Oh, and I have a personal power plant in my backpack. We plug it in, turn that sucker on, and get to my next destination. Where it may not be about, can I find my electric charging station, or can I find my gasoline? It might be just more about like us thinking about this problem differently in terms of power plants. So when you... Small scale power plants. So when you... Portable small scale <laughs> power plants. Portable power plants, the three P's. Yeah, when you fantasize about these things, where do you go with this? I think aircraft. I really think that, you know, how much... The area behind an operating gas turbine engine is just as dangerous as the intake area. Fossil fuel gets burned to move us from New York to Los Angeles. Yeah, crazy. Right? What's the impact of that? On this particular flight, with a 7 cruising at 365 miles an hour, it's possible to have a late breakfast in New York and dinner in Los Angeles. 65 luncheons today, served from the world's most efficient buffet. Mr. Finchley isn't finicky, but he likes good food, and he really likes that lamb chop. I'm not that kind of scientist. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't go that deep into atmospherics. Now, 
I studied combustion and fluid mechanics and all the rest of that kind of stuff, but I'm not that deep in that domain. But it seems reasonable to say, if I have another choice, would I use it? If I had another choice, then generating water vapor and CO2, would I use it? I would, especially if it was non-contaminating. If I tell you, pick any job, where would you go? Not a company name. Yeah, yeah. What would you do? It would, it would probably be something like... Second thing is like a hand on a face, rubbing. Could be like a sign of anxiety or a sign of thinking. They're thinking about something that's going on. Hmm, what should I do? A personal air vehicle powered by low energy nuclear reactions. You want to work on it, yeah. build it. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, that would just be amazing. Would you go to Mars? They're thinking about something that's going on, hmm. Yes. Would you be one of the first? I don't think I would. I don't, I would not be the first hundred. The first thousand, probably. Thousand? Yeah. 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 Would you agree to do anything needed? If it came Another with planet and trainings and lots of laps and swimming pools and lots of stuff to make you fit enough to for the journey, yeah, I would do all of those things. Psychological fitness, you know, physical fitness, I, I would do all of that as preparation, without a doubt, yeah. One way or two way? I would want to come back. I would want to go there and yeah. come back. I mean, barring biological contamination yeah, issues, yeah, yeah. right, you know, I, I, you need to quarantine in both directions, right? What do you mean? Quarantine. Well, you don't want to bring microbes from this planet there that could potentially devastate native mi microbiome species if they exist. Okay. So you don't want to kill them off. Sure. And the other way around, you don't want to bring a virus. I mean, COVID is a perfect example of this. You don't want to bring biological contaminants from Mars to here and then wipe all of us out. I mean, it's a bad idea. So you would want to quarantine on both, both sides. No, not, I mean, Mars could be barren. Fine. Yeah. That would actually make the, the, the quarantining a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Which would more be about like, did you bring a bug and because of the conditions on Mars it mutated and when you brought it back it's now a new strain and then you know more invasive or whatever. Yeah. So I think there'd still be some quarantine on in in the return home direction. Sure. Getting on this idea of cold fusion, if we have like right now regular hot fusion like what the sun does and what they're trying to do in these tokamak reactors. Heavy, large, big scale devices. Like if there was a breakthrough there, I mean that would definitely shorten the time it took us to get there. And if you've got lots of chemical fuel, you could make a rocket, you know, there's plenty of billionaires who've proven you can make a rocket that can go very high very fast. But give it enough thrust and it will go. I'm going back to Mars just Yeah. Do you get to dream about living on another planet? That's a good question. Thank you. That's a good question. I'm a little bit more partial to Venus than Mars. And not yeah. because Venus is presently habitable. It's yeah. grueling pressures and temperatures and yeah. it would last, you know, a yeah. very short amount of time while you got crushed and burnt. Yeah. However, you know, I think there's a lot of us scientists who go back a long enough ways remember this idea of what it is to terraform a planet and Venus is a lot more mass than Mars and so if you want to live there for an extended amount of time and you're more like 80% of the mass of Earth I don't know what the exact number is I don't look it up but Mars was a lot lighter <laughs> really smart billionaires get there they're still gonna have to create some sort of artificial gravity, whether that's a rotating structure or something, just to assist in us not atrophying so quickly on a foreign world. Like, I, I am really, honestly, like, I, if there's a Mars bar, I, I definitely want to go to the Mars bar and have a drink with you. I'm sure it'll be spinning at some rate to, to simulate 1G conditions, but I would definitely do that. That would just be great, you know? And then I might ask you a question like, this might be far too woo for most engineers, but like, what's your soul's calling? <laughs>
I mean, we're on another world. Why not? Why not? Why not go a little more esoteric? We could go from from engineering to cosmic engineering, engineering our souls or something like that.